start the recording? Oh, great. Someone's, someone's doing it already. That's great. Thank you. Um, so my name is Monique Potts and I'll be um, helping to sort of host and, and chair the session today um, in which uh, Morag Gamble will be um, talking to us about permaculture in a wellbeing economy. Um, and uh, so I'm I'm on the board of Nina, um, uh, which is I guess the hat I'm wearing at the moment, and I'm joining from the inner west of Sydney um, on Gadigal land. Um, so great to have everyone here. And I um, this is a, a workshop session, 50 minute workshop session, and I might hand over to you, Morak. Great, thank you, Monique, and thank you everyone for being here on a Sunday morning. Um, so I'd like, before I begin, to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm meeting with you today. I'm here on the land of the Gubby Gubby people, um, on, the, on the banks of the Mookaboola River, also known as the Mary River, um, in a place called Crystal Waters, which is an eco-village in the Sunshine Coast hinterland, not far from Mullaney and about an hour or so north of, of Brisbane. So what I thought I might do is I'll share a bit of a presentation, but duck in and out of um, conversation throughout that. So um, please feel free to also ask questions and um, engage in the chat too. So in the last session, which was um, a brilliant session here in, in room one, uh, there was sort of comment waterfalls and things. So I, I feel like you kind of know what to do with that kind of thing as well. So um, we might uh, engage in some of that too and also at the end have a have a chance to be able to uh, um, really reflect on 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 the sort of the topics that I wanted to raise with you in this session so what I might do now is just share my screen uh, let's see so you get to see all the messy background and my desktop here we go so I wanted to begin by uh, talking about this idea of planetarian practivism. There's a couple of words that I've come across recently. So I was looking at the work of um, the circular economy recently, and one of the concepts they're talking about around food was this idea of not being vegan or not being vegetarian, not being pescatarian, not being this, but we're planetarian. So whatever you choose, that your choices, the decisions of your food system are based on them being uh, for the well-being of the planet and the people and all life that exists on that planet. So I really love this term. And the term practivism um, comes from my engagement with um, this global fantastic youth network called Perma Youth. And so they talk about practivism as being this practical, positive activism based around permaculture that they can step up into the world and be doing climate action, but with their hands firmly in the earth. So um, so that's why I love these two new words and I, I think I'm going to start using them a whole lot more because it helps to really um, make sense. Um, so I'm, I'm from the Permaculture Education Institute and uh, this is kind of the work that I do all the time. Oh my gosh, sorry, I seem to be on a really weird... <laughs> Actually, I've shared you the wrong presentation. That's pretty handy, isn't it? Let me, let me go back to... Um... Hmm. something very odd's happened. If you just hold on a second. What I might do while I'm trying to work this out then, I might play you a song from the Perma Youth. I was going to do it at the end, but I'll do it at the start now so I can give you a chance to hear these incredible young people who are taking permaculture into the refugee settlement. So let me do that while I get my presentation sorted again. Sorry about that. Thanks, Maura. That'd be great. Uh, so let me just... Share my screen with the sound optimized. Okay. Is five lead and factor maker present Palma Kacha locates in Kenya Kakuma refugees come. Japanese production. Mora Gambe. God bless you wherever you are. Amasa Kina Kiriba. You are the best in this. Silla B. Asante kwenu vichana palma kacha Community inafaid ngufu zenu Tafazali msije kutuacha Tunaitaji umoja wenu Palma kacha mmetuletea Tuna cabbage, kuna tomato, matempele Pia sombe, udongo safi, unaunawili 
tunakula vya kula bora udongo safi unaona wili tunakula vya kula bora kupitia palma kacha tuna mama sakina tuna mora gambe tuna mama sakina asante sana ku support palma kacha palma Special thank to you Mora Gambe for your support without forgetting Sakina Kiriba for implementing Palma Youth in Kakuma refugees camp Palma Kaja we work with culture Mora she is our teacher every day we need the future we say thanks for Palma Kaja chakula bora tunakula kila siku tunapata hata zuru huku huku spinach lenga lenga sio kuku tunakula mchana na usiku bado mwanzo ina uwezo itangazo sio vikwazo tunafaidi cause palma culture tunapata kivuno jema tunatumia mbolea za asili na kujipatia mavuno mema tunatumia pia na akili na ukweli inajenga mwili mboga zote chakula chote tunakula tukiwa wote kupitia palma culture tuna mama sakina Fajiri kwal makacha kweli ni hatari kila day tunashukuru tuna say ina uhuru no kupepe makacha ya fahulu tupendane tupatane tusiwale pale makacha na mwane pale makacha njana kuna chemical ni chakula bora kwa jamii sisi wote lazima tukubali wezi pata dalili ya kemikali shukurani kwa mama sakina kutupatia elima pale makacha tunatumia mbolea za asili tunapanda mazao mbali mbali palma Hope you I hope you were able to hear that and it came through okay and the it, um, because there's something amazing that's happening in these camps and it's deeply connected with the permaculture planetarian work that's happening with with perma youth so they're young teens who are connecting with young people who've initiated this in Australia and um, it's just absolutely um, heartwarming to see what what is going on over there um because of the songs that these teenagers are making and they make them for each of the festivals of the perma youth um they they were actually able to attract some attention to get some funding to build a solar powered rammed earth permaculture education center recording studio right in the refugee settlement and um that's just about to open right now which is absolutely phenomenal so anyway i've worked out my presentation now um with my picture so let me let me reshare that ah oh, dear sunday morning unbelievable isn't it stop sharing That was very inspiring, that um, video. Thank you, Morak. <laughs> what a great project. All right. So um, I think you can, I think you can see me. Can someone just write in the chat where you can actually see my presentation? Yep, we can. Now. That's, that's looking good now. Thank okay, you. Awesome. I think so. Can anyone? Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Yep, okay, so let me continue. So as I've been saying, really permaculture is about planetarian practivism. And for me, this comes back to this idea that 
we really need to be looking at how we can focus on one, one planet living. Um, back in July was actually when we overshot um, the Earth's capacity to support us and to absorb our waste. So pretty much everything else that was done as a planet since that day is going over the budgets, eating into future generations, eating into wildlife habitat, um, capacity to support itself. Last year was August 22. So we've really, even though we had a bit of a dip for a while, we've jumped way back up um, into being months and months um, overshot. Uh, and if you look at actually Australia's overshoot day, it's March 22nd. So pretty much everything from that day uh, until the end of the year is eating into future generations, other species. So and we add up all the ecological footprint, we need four planets if everyone was living like a, typically Australian, a typical Australian. The last time we lived a one planet way of life was 1969, the year that I was born. Um, so this is this is kind of the focus of that really has made me feel deeply impassioned to make a difference. And I've as I've explored all of the different things and ways of activism, I keep coming back to food. You know, the impact of our diet alone is so impactful. I could just start listing some of the things that it does. And this is why I focus on food. And sometimes I feel like we can go, oh, well, you know, that's just gardening or that's just, you know, actually when you look at the impact of the food system, what we can do by focusing on realigning the food system as the basis of a well-being economy, um, we can unpack a whole lot of stuff. You know, instead of our diet being defined by corporations, inherently unjust, the driver of deforestation and climate change, loss of habit, lots of habitat, um, the living soil destroyed, living water, you know, the list goes on. And, and down the bottom here, talking about food sovereignty, loss of cultural knowledge, pollution and poisoning, all of these things are deeply embedded in our food system. 70% um, of the fresh water that's used on the planet is used for agriculture. Um, we're eroding human health and well-being and widespread malnutrition, both in terms of overconsumption and underconsumption. Um, and also, you know, that we have this system of modern slavery. And these young folks that you saw at the start there from the refugee settlements, they're living in a situation where they have um, they receive three dollars a month. Uh, from the UNHCR to be able, and the World Food Programme to be able to buy food. So this is where permaculture comes in and why I focus so much on permaculture, because it's really looking at what is the culture that we can create and live into that helps us to create a culture of permanence, a culture of resilience. And so essentially that's what permaculture is to me. It's a one planet living and it's based deeply on these ethics of earth care, people care and fair show. It's deeply about how we care about us being connected to place, connected to one another, caring for what's happening to other species and other communities, as well as our own health and environment. So in essence, it's about designing for healthy human habitats. And from an earth care perspective, it is about um, helping to restore the diversity, helping to restore the living systems, the healthy habitats for not just us, but other species and developing up even within our food systems, this um, level of abundance and, and polycultures. From a people care perspective, it's really looking at finding ways to embrace um, the, the notion of re-inhabiting the commons and restoring our local economies and um, helping to set up cooperatives and eco-villages and all the things that were being talked about in, this, in the session just before this. This is um, a lot of the conversation that comes around sort of through the people care aspect of permaculture. So I think too, I wanna to help to sort of expand the concept of what permaculture is from being something you do in your backyard garden to something that a lens that you apply to your life. And so from a fair share perspective, so earth care, people care, fair share, it's really looking deeply at how we can be in the process of decolonization and addressing social justice and redistribution and maybe tithing some of our income from, uh, from the wealthy communities to support, you know, the kids that we've just seen in the refugee settlements. Um, so essentially uh, the permaculture ethics, as I mentioned, uh, earth care, people care and fair share. And I, I just wanted to um, pause here at the moment and ask you in the chat to see, you know, how do you think you could apply these or how do you already apply these kind of ethics in your own communities? Um, so it, we don't need to do a, a waterfall, but if you've got any thoughts or comments on that, if just to pop them into the chat. And do these ethics that you see in a permaculture context relate to the kind of ethics that you also 
um, see in your daily life or the, the way your lens that you are applying. Does anyone have any thoughts about that? Yeah, so Jenna's talking about growing growing her own veg on a teeny tiny balcony. And, you know, this is the thing, like you may only have a teeny tiny space that you work with, but focusing on how you can then connect uh, with uh, community gardening, community composting. Even here at the at the Eco Village where I live, you, you know, I, I grow a lot of my food in and around my home, but not everyone does. And so we, we're exploring... You know, even here, things like community composting, community farm, maybe employing a farmer to grow the food that we need. So, you know, thinking beyond the boundaries, because it's this way of life, this developing up, um, being a planetarian is not something that you can do alone. It definitely is something that we need to do as a community. And so this sense, too, of mapping out where your food systems are in a broader sense. So Ceres in Melbourne, I know, has this map of, of an orchard an, an urban orchard and so mapping where people's different trees are and so looking beyond the borders of our own little places and to seeing how it is that we're living in place together so there's lots of yeah so social social food food bank in the parkland yeah fantastic yeah keep keep adding them in because i think there's so many different dimensions like i was saying beyond the growing of of the food uh, so i'm just going to pop back into the presentation and keep going. So this is a little bit of where I live. Um, so essentially we're in uh, 640 acres of, of land here. It's been going for over 30 years now and we have uh, 250 people living here of all different ages and backgrounds. I think there's 16 different nationalities that I uh, registered recently. Uh, and so what we've done here is sort of kind of like a demonstration. It's a play space for looking at how we can live a more planetarian life. And that's kind of how I see it. Um, so this house here that I built, you know, all the railings there are all from trees that had to be, um, that, that were coming down in, a, in another part of the community. Um, I reclaimed all the wood um, surrounded by gardens, all the wastewater that comes out of the house goes into the garden or the food scraps go back out, the chickens get. So there's this circularity that happens. And you also think very closely about what comes out of your sink back into the landscape, for example, because that's what you're going to eat. So this closeness and the reweaving of our impact and our, and our way of life onto um, the surrounds and back again helps us to really re reimagine what it is, that we, how we want to live in space. Um, a key part of what we do here too is, is ecological restoration. This was a really degraded piece of farmland. So it's about how we can bring uh, food production, wildlife and people together in, in, in one space. And so that's really at the heart of it. How can we rewild our way of life, rewild our farming and, um, and help to restore the landscape in a way that puts people in the landscape with it. And essentially it's about having a simple local abundance and growing low embodied energy and water food, uh, growing food and meeting our daily needs in a low waste way. Uh, so essentially, you know, the gardens that we do have are about growing for well-being of people and planet. But in order to do that, though, we need to start stepping back and seeing a bigger picture. You know, you can't just plonk a vegetable garden in and go, okay, well, I'm going to start growing my food. We need to start thinking about how we can rehydrate the landscape to really slow it, spread it, sink it, store it, put moisture back in the soil and hold it there. But how do you do that? Then you have to focus on actually rewilding the soil to hold that. So you start and you need to be able to read the landscape to see how the water moves. So it's really very much about a design process and starting to understand how nature works in that particular context. And, and so in order to do this too, we need to um, rewild ourselves in order to be able to step into the space rather than just think, okay, well, I'll just plonk a veggie garden there and I'll, I'll get the, the, the one that I can buy at the shop and, you know, fill it with stuff that I can buy at the shop. How can we start to step back and see how we can enter into this um, beautiful space of being in connection? And so we need to rewild our hearts, our minds, and also our hands. And, a, you know, an absolutely essential part of doing this is, uh, listening to the elders and listening to the Indigenous communities who have the knowledge of place. And so I spend a lot of time with people who live in and around here. And, you know, it's 
I've learned so much about how to actually grow food in a way that makes sense and that will work um, through these conversations. And so, you know, also I think it's a really important thing to consider, well, what is, it, what is the kind of food system that is part of our wellbeing economy that can help to reduce poverty, reduce climate change, cool the planet, restore biodiversity, soil fertility, water resources, improve livelihoods and produce actually enough food? And um, so this is, these are the questions. And, you know, in a bigger picture of looking at how permaculture works in a whole sense, I think um, we, we can apply it to broad scale farming, we can apply it into our backyard gardens, to community gardens, we can apply it in refugee settlements, it works in any different context. But what are some of the easy places to start? Well, you know, on your balcony is a good place to start and, and connecting with things like herbs and salads. Um, but I don't know if we can see this picture here of these lettuces that have been planted, but what I'm more excited about is what's in between, in the liminal space, in between what we think is food. And that's where we find the richness and the diversity and the possibilities. And it opens up our possibilities in our mind. Uh, so, you know, in between this, we start to see lots of things like chickweed, which is comes by itself. We don't have to plant it. It comes up when the conditions are right and it's totally edible. It's edible for us. It's edible for our animals. And so we try so hard sometimes to actually grow food when in actual fact, we step back and and have a different lens on how we enter into this relationship with, with our food system, it can be so much easier. So, you know, some things that we can start to think about that helps us to, I would say, grow at least 10 times more food than we ever thought possible is simply by eating more of each plant. So on the left is a picture of uh, turmeric growing. So if you have a little chunk of turmeric at home, you can just plunk it in the ground now and it will start to grow. Mine's just starting to sprout up. All of these leaves are actually edible and they're really nice when they're young. You can use them to wrap, you can slice them up, you can um, even use them when they get a bit older to wrap food and cook it in, in that. So, you know, why wait to the end of its life when you dig up the dead plant and get the roots out when you can be eating all the way along? Same with the snow peas, like we wait for the snow pea, but you can be eating the flowers, the leaves, the shoots. And pumpkin is the most one of the examples that I use all the time because you can be eating the leaves, the flowers, the shoots, the skin, the seeds. You know, we think about the pumpkin being just the orange stuff, whereas absolutely all of it is. And if you start to think about you know, we hear about these figures about food waste being, you know, we have, um, you know, 30% food waste. I would hazard a guess that we would actually be wasting maybe 70, 80, 90% of the food we're growing simply because we don't eat most of the edible parts that the plant offer because we're in an industrial food system. So, um, you know, yes, thank you for adding in other things. There's other different plants that we can be eating more of as well. And instead of trying to grow the things that we see in the shops, you know, like the cabbages, the cauliflowers, the, you know, which often are the things that are really hard to grow and end up getting buggy in, grow the hardy foods, the disaster resilient, the locally adapted food, the things that grow without any care and assistance. You can walk away for months, come back, and that will still be growing. And you can actually, the more you trim them, the more they come back. So I fill my garden with these plants. So what you're seeing here is my uh, potato equivalent, which is a, a can of edulis. In the middle here is my society garlic, which I use the edible flowers for to make pestos and pasta sauces and all um, instead of growing garlic because it's there all the time. Brazilian spinach, instead of trying to grow spinach, which gets, you know, bug eaten and wilted, this grows beautifully. So as you can see, this wherever you are, there'll be things like this. So it's an, in essence trying to think about rewilding your garden. And the more you rewild your garden and create these beautiful big beds of, of planting, the more that you're rewilding the soil. The more that rewild the soil, the more it will activate and open up the soil and absorb the, new, um, the moisture and feed the fungal mycelial networks, which go deeper and further to collect the moisture and the nutrients and bring them up. And what you notice too is that when that is thriving and alive, that it actually there's the plants communicating. You know, you've heard about these, um, this new research in what's going on actually underneath the ground. There's so much diversity and so much we don't know um, that if one plant over here is getting bug eaten, uh, what happens is that the, um, the, plant, it, the plants release uh, a, a kind of a message that gets sent through the internet of the underground and can we, communicates with the other plants that are in relation to it. So it's all relational. And then they will then release something which makes them less appealing to the particular pest. 
And so, you know, one might become a sacrificial plant, but the rest thrives. So when we separate things into their little boxes, you know, yes, yay, um, Suzanne, absolutely. You know, when we separate things into the boxes, it's like when we separate disciplines, it's when we separate um, communities, um, when we separate anything, we lose that interconnectedness and the, and the communication. That's the same in the garden. I find the gardens are such a beautiful place to learn about the lessons of living um, as a planetarian and, and in, a, in a systems view of life. And so, you know, food is everywhere. There's so much food around us. We don't have to struggle and strive to be doing it in the way that we're doing it now. We need to really be able to help to, to rewild and to engage in this foraging and to sharpen our lens about what's everywhere. I was recently at the, um, the old museum in Brisbane and um, I went round the back. I was waiting for my daughter to come out of her music event and, and uh, there all around all the rockeries was this purslane and it's, it's a beautiful food. And then further along there was rosemary. The whole of the landscape was full of edible plants and all we need to do is sharpen our lens to see that and um, also to integrate the diversity of edible perennials. There are more than 30,000 different sorts of edible plants, but we rely on three just three for 60% of our food, corn, wheat, and rice. It's absolute insanity, and it's why we have the destruction that I listed earlier in this presentation. So some of these, you know, like this is a Madagascar bean. It's improving the soil. At the same time, it's perennial. It grows for seven years. Um, absolutely beautiful protein. Um, and things like this leaf ginseng is an amazing um, spinach alternative that just grows almost wild. And diversify our fruit system, what, what grows in our own climates that is hardy and has a long harvest. So you're just constantly harvesting throughout the year, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And also diversifying what we see um, is suitable to eat as a root crop. You know, we potato is the main sort of thing that we have here, but there's all these other things, yams and um, taros and cassavas and um, all kinds of things. So the one in the middle is cassava, and it actually feeds probably um, the tenth of the world's populations with their main source of carbohydrate. We, we hardly ever see it here, except possibly if you eat things like veggie chips, and then it's been made into powder and reconstituted. Um, and but you know these sorts of things are just so easy to grow. And also three D, you're thinking in your garden about how, how you can use all the vertical spaces. And um, self-seeding, encouraging volunteers. You know, volunteers are the things which bring the abundance and the deliciousness into your garden. I don't think I've planted tomatoes for over a decade or pumpkins for that matter and lettuces and parsley. So, you know, it's focusing on creating the context in which life can thrive, in which seeds can emerge, in which, um, you know, and picking and selecting the type of seeds that are able to be um, say, um, generated year after year. And then eating everything again too, even the flowers. So, you know, I, I wonder whether you knew that even things like begonias and bougainvilleas and even bananas are edible. There's so much food there. And then I, I want to talk a little bit about um, teas as well because um, I, I spend a lot of time talking with people in Africa and one of the things that one of the um, people recently told me was that... Um, he grows tea. He inherited this tea farm from his father. He's actually starting up a permaculture farm somewhere else. And he said he's about to rip out all the tea plants and plant food for us because he said he grows tea, but for a thousand kilograms of tea that he grows and which takes an enormous, it takes all year to grow this tea, he gets $100. It's absolutely insane. And then when we think of, you know, so this is even if it's grown, you know, so called ethically. The injustice of it is just enormous. And also, you know, he says, I'm destroying my land. There's no diversity. Um, people's lives and, you know, just tied to this tea place. And then when you when you get them in the bags, about 70% 70, 70 of those paper tea bags are paper. The rest is plastic. And so we can't even compost them. So, again, you know, what can we grow in our own place? So I grow, you know, everything from meat to le meat, mint to lemongrass to rosellas. I wonder, you know, what are some of the things that you grow in your garden at a tea? Um, you know, I discovered a while ago that actually the, one of the best green teas comes from an olive plant. Like I wonder whether any of you actually have olive plants in your gardens or on your verandas that never produce olives. I have one up the top here. Like I live in the subtropics and so olive trees are not particularly um, aimed at being here. Uh, and uh, sorry, not 
belonging here, a pine needle tea, amazing. Um, I and so I was having a chat with the olive tree, saying, "I really need the space for something else because we, you know, we're just there's not much going on here." And so I started research, thinking, "Okay, I've got olive leaf, I've got lots of olive leaf." And then I went, "Oh, of course, olive leaf extract is something that we we." Um, you know, we, if we go to cold, we go and buy from the store the extract of that. So I was trying to find out how to make it. And then in the end, I thought, you know, that sounds a bit complicated. I wonder if I can just drink it as tea. And yeah, of course you can. So you can just grab handfuls of the, the leaves of the olive leaf. And um, so handfuls of the leaves and then just put it in a teacup. And that is a beautiful green tea. And it has the sort of the mild immunity building system. Um, if you just mind, um, just a minute, I just need to talk to my son. Hang on a And, you know, there's so much stuff that you can do as well for your body, you know, or for the household. Instead of buying, you know, plastic things like uh, wipers, you can grow loofers, which you can cut up and use as a scourer or a body scourer and then just pop them in the compost. And the calendula and the comfrey end up being, uh, you know, salves for the body or healing salves that can be used. And aloe vera so easy to grow all you need to do is grab a leaf of that when you've come out of the shower wipe it through your hair and it's a leave-in conditioner so it's nourishing and it's um, plastic free and it's something that is really supporting your health and well-being and, and you can also use it internally and externally so everything like in your garden can and your community garden school garden can become part of this space where we rewild the soil rewild our lives um, and so, you know, a key part, like I've said before, is actually nurturing the soil, rehydrating it, focusing on feeding the soil, protecting the soil, enlivening the soil, adding organic matter. If you've got chickens, you know, like that cycle goes back in growing things, particularly for the soil. Like I grow comfrey for the soil. And when I'm harvesting from my garden, I leave the roots in the garden and I do in situ composting. So wherever I think there's the soil needs some enlivening, that's where the compost goes. I don't have my mind, okay, I'm going to compost. So I'll take my stuff to the compost bin. The compost is there to nourish the soil. So it's this flip, this consistent flip. And also thinking about the multiple dimensions of all plants that you grow. So, you know, for example, this daikon radish, this amazing plant, um, provides shade in the garden. It, it, I can chop and drop it as a mulch. It's food for animals. It's food for me. I can ferment it. It opens up the soil with these great big roots and um, and also the roots as they die back become soil food. You can get the seeds, which you can use as a spice. And of course, there's habitat, you know, find frogs and little birds all amongst there. So, you know, again, re redescribing how we see the food that we grow as part of so many different aspects of, of our life. And so thinking about creating edible polycultures that have these multiple, multiple dimensions and multiple layers so that we have you know, trees and shrubs and herb layers and think about what's going on under the ground and what's climbing through and maybe there's some, some aquatic wetland space. And then of course the fungal mycelium network. And so I, I try and re-describe also my vegetable garden from the concept of a food forest. So it's more of a forage garden. And so we're designing and growing our gardens and our farms and our lives for the health of the living system. So essentially what this is doing is helping to condense our footprint. You know, if we do this, we're not contributing to the global um, corporate food system and we're helping to protect and regenerate the natural and wild spaces that are around us. So the goal really would be how can we regenerate at least and protect at least 50% for nature in our garden and you know it can be way more than that as we weave it uh, weave it through so intensely and that everything that we grow become pollinator habitat and everything we grow we can collect and share seeds from um, we've lost so much of our seed diversity um, over the last hundred years vandana shiva talks about um, the beauty of the seed is that out of one you can get millions and that's an economics of abundance so you take one of these mustard spinach seeds in my hand here and you plant that and you'll get probably 10,000 from one plant and it's just absolutely extraordinary the abundance and diversity and so what what Vandana also talks about is that you know in nature's economy the currency is not money it's life 
And I think that's absolutely beautiful. So we can do a whole lot of things, you know, and you may not want to be a gardener or a farmer, but, you know, if you did, there's a whole lot of different ways you can make your livelihood or part of your livelihood from this, from market gardening to mushroom farming to woodlots, bush foods, honeys, eggs, teas, um, creating a food box system or, an, you know, online shop. That's one thing. Or if it's just for you in, in, in your home, as well as the food that you can grow um, outside, you can incorporate microgreens or even have a spirulina tank inside, um, propagate all different sorts of things from, um, you know, your own seedlings, which you can share or edible plants in a nursery, ferment your food and, and um, do dry herbs and herb teas. And, and, you know, so there's lots of little income possibilities from this. But beyond, beyond that, um, it's looking about how we can reach out to our community to create that broader food system and, and sharing with our food cooperatives and um, sourcing what we can't grow locally from local sources. And then, yeah, packing up our balcony gardens. I've got on a film on one of my YouTube um, clips for this balcony garden from Nairobi, and I um, highly, highly recommend it if you're a balcony gardener to see what she does, everything from insect homes to trellises to um, growing little insects to feed her um, balcony chickens and and you could create rooftop gardens as well and you know I think if we you know if you're an architect maybe think about how to design this into the the way in which buildings are created um, or if you're um, this woman here on the on the left is a social worker so she worked with these um, community housing estates in uh, in Manchester to block off some streets and open up the streets for uh, community play spaces in in Barcelona there's edible fruit trees everywhere which at the end of the season if they're not harvested get turned into um, preserves that get given around as Christmas presents from the council and then there's whole suburbs that are designed with this kind of thinking in mind where most of the commons is actually edible commons or wild space commons where you know there's seven tons of almonds that are harvested from the street trees and the the main pathway through the middle of the of the uh of the settlement is flanked by fruit trees and community gardens the way they can do that is by shifting the way that the settlement is designed so that the cars get left on the outside and all the public space that normally gets put towards um, cars actually gets used for beautiful um, common space to grow food and to to rehydrate the landscape and also you know temporary gardens if there's a little corner somewhere to find ways to fill it up i love this little um kind of a, it was almost like a an activism statement here in the middle of new york where they just dropped off a garden a temporary garden in a car parking space for four hours and, and moved it on to another spot but we can you know we can do it in all different places so community garden growing food and community wherever you are uh, engaging in weekend farming this I saw all throughout Hong Kong and other places around Korea where people had such small houses and apartments with no space to grow that they made relationships with farmers on their peri-urban areas uh, and then and went out each weekend to grow food and the farmer there um, looked after their gardens during the week and so all kinds of relationships can be formed and you know in Cuba when in the special period uh, parks started to get part of parks started to get turned into food growing areas and uh, in the refugee settlements, I mean, it's essential that the commons get used for this. I think, you know, we have this affluenza where we're, we don't actually see the value or the importance of it. But when we actually really bring the connection back into focus and see all the multiple dimensions and the impacts of not doing this, I think, the, you know, we can argue quite other than that. So school gardens uh, everywhere, um, educational gardens everywhere, from universities to public uh, parks to um, church grounds, um, creating urban forests in our homes and, and neighbourhoods. They're beautiful, diverse and lovely spaces. Um, and then, you know, engaging in whatever way you can, whether it be with, you know, elderly groups or refugee groups or kids groups or, you know, find positive and practical and purposeful ways. And this is that practivism and um, to engage. Uh, so, you know, one of the ways that my kids have really stepped up into this is starting the, the PERMA Youth, which is a global learning network. And they organise things like camps and classes and online festivals that are intergenerational and cross-cultural. And really, you know, I think the key with this is actually opening up the conversation uh, and hosting possibilities for people to learn and to become more skilled in the practice because, you know, it's something that... 
um, has not been encouraged or learned unless you've been coming through a recent Stephanie Alexander program or whether you've been taught by it by an elder. But there's a gap. There's a huge gap. Um, and when you do start to learn, start to share. Share your ideas, share your cutting, share your seeds and make your landscape, whatever it may be, a learning place. And then I ripple that out as far and wide as you possibly can to help support people in other parts of the world where um, they're really struggling absolutely struggling to do any of this work um, so part of our work too is is connecting into communities in east africa but one of the books that i wanted to mention that i think might be really useful to use david holmgren's more recent book um retro suburbia which is looking about how we can apply this in an urban suburban context how we can take all these ideas and create well-being communities that are um, where we are in, you know, for Australia, most of where people live is suburbs. What can we do there? So I highly recommend you get that. They also have a book club and a whole uh, many resources that are attached to that too. So essentially, you know, from a from what I've, all the things I've been talking about, a bit of a summary is really about permaculture being a focus on this one planet living, really deeply embedded the ethics of care and um, looking re how we can redesign uh, our habitats. At, to be healthy human habitats, it means we reduce our ecological footprint. And, and through that, we're regenerating our farming and gardening practices. We're creating regenerative economies, a regenerative culture, and also revitalizing our local communities. Um, and so, you know, this activism approach has deeply been inspired by these youth conversations. So if you know young people, please encourage them to get involved. If you are all interested in looking um, at the kind of work that we're doing with um, the refugee settlements, we're offering um, support for local leaders to be running free permaculture education and setting up kitchen gardens for women and youth um, throughout East Africa. There's now a, a locally led network by this man in the middle, Bemariki, who um, connects through 11 different camps in East Africa. Um, if you're wanting to find out some really practical information, check out the YouTube channel that I have, which has hundreds of films about how to do stuff <laughs> and um, visits to different people's places, conversations with people. So that's it. Um, More our gamble, our permaculture life. There should be a life at the end of that there. Um, and the same, uh, you can also find lots of resources on my blog, which is by the same name, our permaculture life. Um, and yeah, lots of tips and how-tos there and links to all the other resources that I've got. Um, if you want to dive in a bit more, I also do monthly masterclasses. The last Monday of every month, we explore a different topic. Um, the topic always comes from the local community. And a weekly podcast, chatting with people around the world who are doing this work, whether they be landscape designers, social workers, um, community activators, scientists, authors. Uh, so join me over at Sense Making a Changing World. And also um, teach permaculture teachers on six continents. So I run that through an online program. So essentially, um, you can find out all the sort of things that I do through this, the Permaculture Education Institute, um, Our Permaculture Life, and with the charity, it's Ethos Foundation. Oh, and, and permayouth is permayouth.org. Um, so I showed you earlier the, the song right at the start um, from these young refugees uh, a number, so the one that you heard was from this group here in the top, uh, the top corner um, called the Ambassador Crew. They started learning permaculture and they decided that they could see an enormous benefit for their community by uh, applying this and said, look, it's too slow. What we want to do is actually be able to spread it further and faster and we need to do that through cultural ways, through music, through dance, through theatre, through television, through film. And so a lot of the young people who are engaged in Perma Youth in the refugee settlements are creatives and they're rippling it out in this way and their influence is coming back into um, the Perma Youth and the permaculture movement around the world. Uh, so I just had a chat the other day with um, a great friend of mine, Rob Hopkins, who started the Transition Town movement and he... Um, He's in COP, he's at COP at the moment in Glasgow, and I've been doing these correspondent conversations with people who are there or who are, um, you know, keen observers. Uh, so talking with Helen Norberg Hodge and about to talk with Fitchoff Capra and um, had a chat with Rob Hopkins. And one of the things he said at the end, you know, when we're talking about, well, what next? What, what do you do after COP? And he just said, just be useful. <laughs> Don't be a passenger, be useful. And so I wanted to ask, you know, like if, you apply a permaculture lens or this planetarian lens to your community. 
what, what do you see already happening and what is it that possibly you could do more? Um, what are some things that you can engage in? Uh, so I think I've stopped showing my screen, which is great. And uh, I thought perhaps that's something we could just um, break out into breakout rooms for to have a, a quick conversation around what are some of the things that have come up for you in, in what I've just talked about and how what do you see and what could you see happening by applying a sort of a planetarian practivism approach? So um, I'm not sure. Do I have the breakout room? I do have the breakout room controls. Or who? Do you like me to do it? Yeah, no. why not? So maybe just, just five minutes. That would be awesome. Um, how, how many people in each room? We've got 16 in the... Okay, maybe four in each room. Sure. Thank you. Thanks, Monique. Monique, um, this is Marcus here in um, at QUT. Um, we got four people in the room, so you don't have to allocate those to breakouts because we'll just use the room as the breakout. Okay. No worries. Okay. Uh, just give me one second, Maureen. Once you don't join, they will fully realize. So I'll grab the, the question again and I'll pop it in the chat. So it, it, while that's happening, if there's any, any um, quick comments or questions that you want to toss in, Okay, I've got those rooms ready to go, Morag. Okay, we'll go straight into that then. Fantastic. All right, let's open okay. open the rooms and I'll see you in about five minutes. Morag, did you want to jump into one of the rooms? Sure, why not? Um, all right.
Welcome back, everyone. I wonder if anyone would like to, to share some inspiration from their group. Um, Sue and I had a wonderful conversation just then. Do you want to start maybe, Sue? Okay, here's the idea. There's um, all these greenfield developments here in Tassie as people come down as COVID refugees and there's little blocks, put a big house on it, not much room around, no trees, nothing, all, you know, with paling fences. What happens if there was a permaculture whole neighbourhood perspective where the whole neighbourhood could get together and somebody, an expert in permaculture could be paid by them to come and do a whole design so that it's moving towards houses that are within a forest rather than plants just around a house. And so you're aiming to get everything connected, your mycelium networks, you might have big shade trees, gum, fruit trees, but shared around the neighbourhood. And what I would love to do with paling fences is have paling fence design where there's doorways in them so that we're not shut off from our neighbours, that there's always doors that go between one and the other. Thanks, Sue. I'm, re I'm really mindful that we have... Um lunch kind of now starting so oh, is there anyone else who would like to maybe make a, a very brief comment about something that happened in, sorry, in their group do that. oops siri doesn't like that idea sorry <laughs> um is there someone that would like to to share just a few words of what happened in their group any inspirations yeah i can go thanks scotty yeah, we actually had two people who were starting farming co-ops in, in separate places in our little group. I thought that was pretty good. Yeah. Um, and social permaculture is sort of a really good uh, way to connect permaculture through to the new economy network. Yeah, great. And I hope that kind of sort of was emerged. I didn't mention the word, but it was rippled throughout the whole entire thing of what <laughs> yep. we're doing. So, you know, like naming it, that's great. Thank you, Scotty. Someone else? Any last thoughts? Hello. Can Hi. you hear us in the wombat room? Oh, no, we're music. Yeah, we, oh, can, we hear can hear you. We can hear you. Okay. Um, very briefly, we mostly talked about kids, our own kids, but also um, Liz going to run um, permaculture for kids, design it with her son, who's nine, which is fantastic. Uh, and also just more, I was really struck when you said, look for the places that the compost is needed. And I sort of took that in a more metaphorical yeah. way in our family. So family is husband, son and myself and just noticing where we each need something and feeding that. So thank you. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, thank you. Compost, compost where it's needed. Absolutely. Well, I think, Monique, I should probably wrap up there. I know you're... Um, We've got lunch coming up. Thank you so much, everyone, for, for joining in. And I hope that the conversations that we've been having here can continue. And I hope that, you know, like I'm always happy for anyone to get in touch with me. I might put my email in the in the chat. Um, let me just, so it's just moraggamble at gmail.com is the easiest, quickest one for me to type. Um, so, yeah, feel free to get in touch. And I would love um, to hear any more conversations around around this and be engaged with you on any project. So reach out. Um, yeah, thank you again. Thank you so much, Morag. I can I can really see why you got such great shout outs from the Ambassador crew. <laughs> your work is amazing and, and so inspiring and um, really appreciate your time today to share all of those insights with us. And I'm going to be going out and looking what I can eat in my garden that I haven't been eating. <laughs> And um, thanks for everyone for, for coming along. Um, so we'll have a lunch break now from 12.40 till 1.40 and look forward to seeing you uh, all back after lunch. Great. Thanks. Good on you. Is, is there a site we can find more of, that, uh, more of those songs on? Uh, yeah. If you go to, um, I'm just going to write it here, perma, permayouth.org. There's a section there that says um, Ambassador Crew or Perma Youth Songs or something. Yeah, you find them there. And I've, 